Hi everyone, my name is Christy Howell and I'm joining you here today from my home office with the capable support of my cats Dobby and Tibby. Tibby's pictured here as the cat who doesn't get social distancing. Um, my colleague Crystal Antone is our office's undisputed champion and expert on all things materials recovery um, and she's pictured here with two of her pets, Zero and Daisy. Both of, our, both of us are happy to talk with you, to correspond with you, to chat via social media, to talk with you um, in your discussion boards for class about any questions that you have regarding recycling and composting here at JCCC, um, student employment in this work, or how wonderful our pets are. That's probably one of our favorite topics. Our contact information is here. Um, both of our email addresses, um, those are both our personals um, at work and then our departmental addresses at work. And we're happy to answer any or all of them. Um, we look forward to hearing from you at your convenience um, whenever you have questions. And then uh, when campus reopens, we'd love to get together and meet with you outside or um, show you around composting or recycling. So don't hesitate to ask questions. So here's an overview of what to expect today. We've got four big points to make. Explaining the circular economy, um, describing what's going on right now with the global recycling system, how we've rethought that process on campus, and then we'll describe some of the biggest problems that we deal with on campus. Um, the processes, the problems, and the solutions that you see here may or may not apply in your home recycling situations. If you're experiencing an issue there and you have questions about who to contact, start with your materials handler. But if you get stuck, again, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy to help you figure out who to talk with. One other thing that I'll mention is that I've cut quite a bit out of this presentation to keep its time manageable. Um, and since Crystal and I both are off campus, mostly right now, for instance, we won't talk that much about paper towel composting in campus restrooms or end user composting in the food court. I'm happy to expand on those things with you via email or in discussion boards, but in the interest of time, I'll try to keep today's conversation focused on practices that apply to our broader community with some big examples of how they work taken from things that we do on campus. Um, one last reminder before we go into some definitions. Um, when we are back on campus, we're really meticulous about signage. So, you know, if you are um, standing at a waste bin in dining services and you're not sure what goes where, um, just pay close attention to the signage that's there. Same goes for uh, paper towel composting in the restrooms. Um, just pay close, close attention to the signage that's there. So, definitions. Some of the terms that I use today um, may be familiar to you but you may be used to hearing them in a different way. It's important that we're all on the same page here though. So for those of you who are watching and using my notes, this is the only slide that will be exactly the same in my transcription as on the slide itself. Um, so materials management refers to the more effective management of items that we might typically put in landfill or in blue, in blue bins. When we talk about a stream, um, we'll always use that term with a modifier. So single stream and clean streams mostly is what we'll talk about. Clean streams are when the majority of items in a group are of the same type, while a single stream refers to the mix of items that go into a blue bin at home or out and about in your community. Contamination in this conversation refers to anything that isn't recyclable or compostable by the rules in your community. Again, um, rules are going to differ based on handlers, they're going to differ based on your region, they may even differ based on your neighborhood. Um, so again, it's really important to pay close attention to the rules that your specific handler has for the items that can and can't go in your blue bin. The big goal in effective materials management is to limit contamination in any stream of material 
and to make it more valuable as a commodity. A commodity is a material that's going to be reused or remade into another item. Um, so for our purposes, what we are looking at is the large scale commodification of what we formerly thought of as waste into a material that can be used and reused again and again. So let's define our current waste stream. Our current waste stream is essentially a linear system. It moves from the extraction of raw materials to the production of consumer materials to the end um, at landfill as waste. The shorthand that we use to describe the current materials economy is take, make, dispose, right? So take, make, dispose. The current system is wasteful. It's inefficient um, and it's especially inefficient because we aren't taking advantage of useful materials that may be dis discarded at any part of this cycle, especially at the end. What might a more efficient system look like? Well, first of all, it would waste less in the production process. It would focus more on reuse at the consumer stage of the process, and it would be more cyclical like this one. Um, where products at the end of their life cycle become a new product entirely or become part of the next generation of the original thing that was made. The important thing to note about a circular economy is that it requires all of the three R's, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. It requires the reduction of raw materials use, the reuse of scrap or used materials that you have, and the recycling of all of those materials at the end of their useful life. This points to the first big idea I'd like you to type away from today. For zero waste systems to work, the material at the end of a cycle has to be destined for a use which is as valued as it was at the very beginning of the cycle that produced it. It's important enough, this idea is important enough to our conversation to, to sort of say it again and to say it a little bit more slowly. If a zero waste system like this one is going to work, the material here at the end of a cycle has to be destined for another use, which is as valued as it was at the very beginning of the cycle that produced it. So let's take a look at this system in practice. Um, we're going to use campus as our system in practice, obviously, since that's where um, Crystal and I work, and Crystal is sort of our, our um, production manager for <laughs> this particular lecture, um, and our Zero Waste to Landfill initiative. Um, there are lots of moving parts within the Zero Waste to Landfill initiative at JCCC, and we're gonna dive first into the one that's probably the easiest to see when you're on campus, and that's recycling. Here at JCCC, recycling, or as we call it, diversion from landfill, has been a huge part of our operations for decades. Starting in the 1990s, the Phi Theta Kappa Honors Society on campus began an initiative to put all of our recycling revenue into the Student Scholarship Fund. That means if you've ever gotten a scholarship from the community college, at least part of it came from somebody's properly recycled thing. What kinds of items do we recycle on campus? We recycle all the things that you'd think of. The items that go in blue bins, for instance, one through seven plastics, more on that later, cardboard, paper, and aluminum. We also recycle several special streams. Office paper, for instance, is one of our more lucrative. We collect materials directly from our print shop to make sure that the waste stream is as clean as it can be. And these other kinds of waste that you see listed here, books, glass, electronics, metals, all in this column here, um, those are all separated out from our single stream as well. Why is that important? It's important primarily because the more uniform and free from contamination your material is when it goes to the handler, the better. Contamination, whether it's from other kinds of recyclable materials, from things that should be in landfill, from lots of food or whatever, 
um, that cheapens the price that you're likely to get per load of material. So this has been a problem lately for a couple of reasons. First, we have a lot of materials. Um, U.S. recyclers have billions of pounds of materials that used to get sent to China and Taiwan for sorting and reuse. But, or shall I say but, starting in 2017, global recycling buyers, of which China and Hong Kong were the most prominent, stopped buying materials from the U.S. These restrictions hit post-consumer plastic waste the hardest, but they also apply to other things that we could typically put in the blue bin. Unsorted paper waste, magazines, and paperboard or cardboard, for instance. So what's wrong with the system to have created this problem? Recycling was broken in the United States long before China's announcement, and they're just exposing the problems that we really need to fix anyway. We were sending dirty trash laden bales of materials that were sorted badly. 40% of Americans don't have recycling access and many product manufacturers are creating packaging that is not recyclable. Um, it's also super expensive to collect and transport material. Um, obviously that depends typically on the price of oil. Um, and so um, with fluctuating oil prices, it can either be a really good risk to take um, you know, to open a new recycling uh, facility or a really bad risk to take. Um, and it became a really bad risk as op opening new recycling facilities became less profitable. Um, and many of them started to close, many of them started to take fewer kinds of materials. And so that's sort of the big problem that we're, con we're confronting um, every day in recycling. How did we help to create this problem? Well, it didn't start overnight. Um, it's really several problems in one. People wish cycle. That's the big one, right? How many times have you thought to yourself, and be honest, um, I'm not real sure if this is recycling, but I'm going to put it in the boy bin and hope somebody will sort it out for me later. I've thought the same thing myself before I learned better. Um, and so we call that wish cycling, right? Um, don't do that because what happens when folks do that more often than not is that you're just introducing trash into your recycling stream. Around a quarter of what JCCC's recycling contractor gets is trash. So what we ask people to do is to think instead of, gosh, I hope somebody will fix this for me. We encourage people to think to themselves, when in doubt, throw it out. Um, when you send poorly sorted materials to your handler, what you end up with is poor quality products. So remember when I mentioned at the very beginning that the material at the end of the cycle has to have high value too? That's where this question of um, contamination and wish cycling comes into play. So remember, the thing to do, when in doubt, throw it out, don't wish cycle. The second part of this problem is creating a demand. We have to do a better job of buying recycled content materials. Here at JCCC, what we've done um, is we've converted to 100% post-consumer content paper. So 100% post-consumer content recycled paper for all of our departmental printing. Um, so that's for all of our office printing. We're, we're also addressing the demand for a high value commodity that we put on the market, right? When we recycle our paper, if we take the time to also purchase recycled content paper, we're closing that loop. Third, oops. Third, Americans buy a lot of single use products. Um, and we've got to do better at working to avoid single use. Um, of course, right now, that's become a question of public health as well. Um, so it's, it's really important that we keep in the back of our minds that when all of this is over and we get back to some semblance of normal, I don't know what that's going to look like either. One of the thing that's, things that's going to become really important is that we start again reducing our reliance on single-use plastics. Um, so we need to work to avoid single use through bulk per purchasing, not taking single use utensils at carry out. Those are all things we should keep in mind. And really those are things that we can engage in 
um, even now during quarantine um, and during this time of COVID-19, we can put in our um, online ordering for food that we don't want to get plastic utensils and napkins with our order, right? If we're gonna just bring everything home and eat it. Um, finally, it's important to keep in mind that we only recycle around 35% of all the recyclable materials that we dispose of. So being a smarter recyclable, I'm sorry, being a smarter recycler um, is a really valuable uh, collection of facts um, that you can rely on both for your campus and for your community. Locally, what this collapse in the recycling market means for us is that we've lost several of our recycling partners, especially in wood waste. Um, we've had to think more creatively on campus about some of our formerly high waste, high value waste streams um, like paper, which we've only recently resumed collecting in a different process from our campus print shop. For single stream recycling, those blue bins that most people think of when you first talk about recycling generally, we weren't able to get a competitive bid for those materials at all, unless they were unbagged. And that's one important point to take home with you um, about home and recycling at your home. When you're at home, you should always follow your handler's instructions on bagging um, and what goes in your curbside bin. You're usually going to be asked to not bag items that are in your curbside bin. And it's worth checking to make sure that you're following those instructions accurately. Um, it's also important to note here um, that on campus, we know that our recycler is able to sell 70% of what they get into the domestic materials market. So that's really important to us because it helps us contribute to the local jobs market. Um, let's take a look at where we're still able to make money at JCCC. That's super apparent on scrap metal. Um, when we got our cardboard baler, um, cardboard was $200 a ton. Now it's $59 a ton. Um, so that cardboard baler has allowed us to send out a more uniform and compact product per um, truckload and therefore to get more money per truckload. Um, we've also avoided additional hauler costs as well. But to be honest, the days of free single stream recycling are over. Um, we used to get really good rebates on what we now pay for um, to make sure that it gets recycled correctly. At some point, we could begin getting rebates again. But for now, we're settling into the idea that it's just less expensive to recycle than to landfill it. Um, let's take one closer look at an area where we do make really good money and the solution that we implemented to do so. Um, scrap metal is one of our more lucrative waste streams and you can see that here. Um, remember that it's important to us to still have high value material because our revenue goes back to student scholarships. So during renovations in the ATB building, our interns were able to remove insulation from um, electrical wiring and copper pipe in order to get a higher dollar value for the material. This is where you can see that the value of clean materials um, stream in action, right? Um, just like with your blue bin at home, the higher quality of the materials that you put in, the higher value they are to a recycler. On campus, the contaminant for this stream was insulation. So our interns wore appropriate PPE, as you can see here, um, and removed all of the insulation from the material before taking it into the scrap yard. So this is just one example of a campus recycling improvement that done, that's done a lot of good here at JCCC. There are improvements going on in the region that are also yielding much better um, materials handling practices as well. At the local level, um, citywide materials management plans are being updated to reflect the new reality with markets. And both drop-off centers and big recycling events like the one um, that we've tried to have in the spring every year at JCCC, it happens in the fall at another community location, 
Those help limit wish cycling that handlers see in curbside pickup every day. Regional governing groups like MARC have also created um, really good illustrated guides that our materials recovery facilities have agreed to. One place we do really, really well, especially in this region, um, is glass recycling. So because Boulevard Brewery has created a closed system for the regional glass market with their Ripple Glass program, we have several offshoot businesses that then use that material that's generated by glass use in the region and secondary materials that have a high value. And remember at the end of that circle in that closed loop, the, the material at the end of the process had to have high value as well. And so Ripple Glass has done that um, by creating insulation at the end, of the end of the process and recycled glass countertop at the end of the process. Um, they're a great example of a single stream that's very clean and high value. Um, they're also creating local jobs. So for the glass cullet that Ripple Glass produces, um, oh, and I should also mention, they have really cool tours. So when they reopen for tours, um, I highly recommend going in. They have some limitations on age that can go on those tours, but um, if you're in a community group or you have Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, um, you should absolutely go. It's a great experience and I highly recommend it. Um, I'm sorry, got distracted. Um, much of the glass cullet that's generated at the Ripple Glass plant goes to fiberglass that's manufactured in Gardner or to recycled glass countertop. Um, so several local municipalities are hoping to replicate some of these successes regionally with other materials. So we know that when we see a success, for instance, with ripple glass and their capacity for turning waste into something very useful, um, if we can do that too with food waste, uh, you think of how effective and useful that would be for our communities. So now that I've given you a bunch of bleak news with a bright point or two, um, because our interns are fantastic and our community work is going well in a lot of areas, let's try to lighten things a bit. So recycling is still the right thing to do. Even if the system is temporarily broken, we still use more biological resources than our planet can renew in a year. So lessening our demand for new materials it just makes good sense, right? We should keep doing that. Since 2017, recycling infrastructure development has increased. We're just working to backfill production for demand at this point. Um, and it's gonna take a little bit of time. So in the meantime, robotics are increasing accuracy and speed in materials handling. In the next few slides, we're gonna take a deeper dive into what happens with the kind of recycling we're almost familiar with the kind that we see at home, single stream. So when you take a look, there's a word missing there. I'm sorry, it should read how to read recycling labels. <laughs> um, anyway, pretend that that word's there. When you take a look at an item, it's typically gonna have some kind of label on it. Um, this might not be true of items that are generally universally recyclable, like aluminum. In that case, as long as the can is empty, into the blue bin it goes. But for items that do have a label, this graphic breaks it down for you. It shows you that the chasing arrows here, um, they generally indicate if the item is recyclable or not. They have a no slash through the arrows if it's not recyclable. And then you may also have special instructions, um, such as to rinse the item before binning it. You can take a look at the how to, that's with a number, how to recycle um, website for more information as well. At JCCC, we tried to make those labels a little bit more explicit with a lot of messaging. I mentioned that earlier with the compost bins, but we also have pretty explicit um, and detailed messaging for items that go into the blue bin. On campus, we can accept the following items in our blue bins. Cardboard, paper, plastic, bottles, and cans. 
things we can't take in any blue bin on campus are, and you can see the nose here, um, plastic bags, styrofoam, see, styrofoam, um, glass, or anything with food or liquid still in it. On the left side of this um, graphic, you can also see our most frequent contaminants, food wrappers, including um, foil lined chip bags. Um, those are, are some of our worst items. And then also styrofoam cups, paper cups, and straws. None of those items go in your blue bin. On the right side here, this is available for home use at recyclespot.org. The KC Area Recycling Info page, um, you'll see a lot of the same problem materials. Plastic bags are by far one of the biggest problems. They're called tanglers because of the way that they get knotted up into giant plastic ropes at the materials recovery facility. To illustrate what happens after you put an item in a blue bin, let's follow a load of recycling through the process. Let's work to answer the question of where things go when you throw them away. So a blue bin of materials on campus, and those blue bins include paper, cardboard, plastic containers numbered one through seven, and aluminum or tin cans. Those are bagged, um, and then they're unbagged, and they go to a materials recovery facility, or MRF. Um, it's a cute little nickname, right, for such a big, fabulous operation. So a materials recovery facility is going to look a lot like this. Lots of um, shake tables and conveyor belts and lots and lots of people. People will always touch your recyclables at the end of their process. And that's one important thing to remember because a lot of the work these people do is both invisible and incredibly valuable. Um, and so it's important to remember that people actually um, dump out the materials out of the truck and they scoop them up into a front end loader where they go into a large hopper. Um, items are then hand sorted. So people pick out the trash in the stream by hand and they are especially working to remove plastic bags. This job has become a lot more dangerous in the past few years as people improperly dispose of needles. So there's a considerable amount of risk involved in this work that people do to make our planet a more habitable space. Um, so be mindful of the people at the end of that process. More advanced MRFs also employ mechanical sorting. Um, there are screens that help sort out items by weight and size. There are magnets and anti-magnets that push and pull metals into different uh, routes through the MRF. There are optical sorters and puffs of air that help move plastics where they need to be. And then robotic sorting arms are some of the newest technology that's coming online as well. After items are sorted into the cleanest possible stream, they're bailed and sold. Here you can see small plastics, paper, bulky cardboard, um, I'm sorry, bulky plastics and cardboard, um, and aluminum, yes, all baled and ready for weighing and sale. So let's take a second to think like a manufacturer. This material, sorted by weight here, is vastly more useful and valuable because it's been sorted and bailed. And it's more valuable than anything that you could buy that's contaminated or a mixed set of commodities. That's why it's really important to keep things out of your blue bin if they aren't supposed to be there. So let's do a quick review. We mentioned this briefly. What items aren't supposed to be there? These items are never recyclable in single stream, and they're often found as contamination. Paper drink cups, styrofoam serveware, paper that's been contaminated with food, plastic wrappers, snack bags, and plastic carrier bags, block styrofoam and packing peanuts. Yes, even though they're marked with a the number six, that does not mean they can go in single stream. 
and napkins, paper towels, and tissues. So on the right side of this graphic, the food contaminated paper, um, napkins, paper towels, and tissues, those can all go in on-campus compost or possibly um, into compost offered by area businesses. If you're a home composter, though, you probably need to tear up larger items before you can compost them at home. Some items we routinely find in single stream are recyclable, just not in single stream. They have to be separated out into a separate clean stream. The biggest one of those is soft, stretchy plastics. So soft, stretchy plastics are one of the biggest problems for curbside collection. That's the primary reason that you're asked to not bag items in your home curbside collection. Those items go into the sorters in a MRF and they tangle everything up. So the test that you can do, and I don't have a plastic bag in front of me to show you. I usually keep one for this. Um, if you can stretch the material just with your fingers, like hold the material up and try to push your thumb through it. If that material stretches, those should go in the collection bins at your area supermarket. That goes for plastic bags, bubble wrap that doesn't have paper on the outside, and packing pillows. Another item is glass bottles. Um, we mentioned a lot earlier, those go in the purple bins, ripple bins that are provided by Ripple Glass. Um, and then textbooks are recyclable on campus in the bins in the bookstore. Make sure that you don't give us anything that you've rented or are to a rebate on. Let's look at one more version of recycling that's really important to us here at JCCC, and that's composting. Composting? That's recycling? Yeah. Composting is the process by which we turn food waste into a very important money-saving soil additive. This part of our campus recycling work is especially important to the interns who make it possible and to the campus farm that uses up all of our compost. We hire up to five interns per year. They're all involved in the work that you've seen here. Um, all They do a lot of the recycling work, but they also do compost. Um, they're paid a good wage and they receive three credit hours um, re tuition reimbursement. It's also been said that this is one of the best upper body workouts that you can get while being paid and getting tuition support. So, you know, come join us as an intern and get strong. Um, I think more importantly, though, our interns are an invaluable part of our family in the Center for Sustainability. Um, interns sort of in their process, they do learn to drive that tractor that you see there. Um, what they do is they take uh, composting from dining services. Do you see here a dining services employee putting, looks like eggs into a bin to go to compost. Um, interns move those break gray bins from dining services and other locations across campus to the compost shed. Um, and here's a picture of an intern dumping food waste into our big um, hopper that we have in the compost shed. And then what happens? Um, the food waste gets mixed with sawdust and wood chips. That allows us to balance the nitrogen rich food scraps with enough carbon um, and it allows us to soak up liquid to make a healthy compost. The great picture here that you see is actually at this far end um, back over here in the compost shed. You can just see the edge of the auger that moves food waste from that mixing hopper up into the compost vessel. Everything runs through the in-vessel industrial composter that you see here. It stays in there about a week. Um, you can almost see it in this picture. I just realized that the vessel has just a very slight tilt. So items as they're mixed slowly move down to this far end of the vessel and you see there are three doors here. Um, we can open those doors and the interns will offload um, into the bays that you see here on the bottom. These bays have been upgraded in the past few years and are now concrete, but the process is the same. Um, interns learn to manage data collection um, because they're tracking food waste weights. Um, they're tracking the weight of 
uh, wood chips and sawdust that they add to the food waste mixture at the beginning. And then they're also tracking temperatures, materials that are offloaded, and day-to-day -day temperatures in the bays. Um, they work several kinds of farm equipment to move the compost around both between bays and then out to the farm, um, which is, it would be sort of off screen way down here um, if, if we were facing um, this particular picture of the bays right now. Our compost operation is a really good example of a closed system. That means that all of the compost we produce and use in this facility starts with waste from campus and becomes soil amendment that we use on campus. Um, it is all used on open petal farm. That's the lab space for our sustainable agriculture program. And we produce the, uh, the only soil amendment that's used out there. Um, so it's a really cool closed system as well. One example of a place where we have an off-campus composting relationship is with our paper towel and post-consumer composting in the restrooms and dining halls. So we have paper towel composting in most of our campus buildings. This is an example of a composting system that we aren't equipped to handle on campus, but we have a really good relationship with Missouri Organics and we're able to divert several dozen tons of material per year from our old landfill costs. You'll see a sign like this um, in almost every restroom that you visit on campus. Um, we do ask that folks are mindful that all that should go in these gray curved bins with the green sticker on front or the green sticker nearby perhaps um, is paper towels. Um, we have a lot of well, we, we have some contamination issues remaining with this particular process. And so we ask folks to be mindful of that. We have a handful of source reduction programs um, for reuse that are um, limited to faculty and staff, but we also have some that are really popular that are available to students. Um, the most popular of those were both sorted by the Student Sustainability Committee and have been supported by the SSC through the years. They are available to, to anyone who's on campus, anyone who visits even. So the use of reusable plates um, and greenies, as you see here, um, that's strongly encouraged instead of the single use cardboard pieces and dining services. And this is one of those things where we've had, a, I think, a temporary behavior change um, and we will see uh, things sort of go back to some semblance of normal, hopefully, in the months ahead. Um, we, uh, encourage folks to use these. They are fairly expensive, um, even when used regularly. If we um, have folks who are using those cardboard pieces, those are fairly expensive, I should say. Um, durable greenies and plates allow us to save quite a bit of money overall by also limiting the weight of items that go to landfill or to our composting contractor. Um, students are welcome to use the greenies when they're back out. Their weight is removed from your purchase. Um, and then we um, strongly encourage everybody to return those regularly to any bus, bin, and dining services or any campus coffee shop. So the use of durable plates and greenies, again, allows us to reduce the total amount that we pay for dining services, um, plates, cardboard plates, and non-reusable utensils. We also have a 25 cent discount on reusable coffee cup use um, here on campus. And um, I've heard that that will soon be rolled into an app for fall release um, so that you will be able to get that um, sort of coffee club credit. Both of these programs allow us to reduce the, the deployment of single use coffee cups. Water bottle refilling stations. It's right there in front of me and I didn't mention it, are um, the last program um, that I'll mention on this particular slide. Our water, bo water bottle refilling stations are all over campus and they're one program that was really, really popular with one of our first student sustainability committees. So these have been on campus for some time now um, and we're really proud to have been an early adopter of this technology that you see um, used a lot more widely. 
um, both across the region and across the country. Um, so the Student Sustainability Committee has through the year supported additional deployment of these. Um, and you should, I think, we have them now on almost in almost every building on campus. I think we, we may have one left to place, if I remember correctly, uh, before classes start. Um, we really count on the Greenies program, the water bottle refilling station, and our coffee cup program as big wins on campus. Um, they're great, and we are incredibly proud of the work that they do in diverting waste from landfill. Uh, but we actually have some pretty gorgeous reuse wins on campus as well. Um, and actually, I should have added another picture here. So the first floor of the library um, has also included a lot of this wood siding. Um, this is the second floor at the checkout desk. And then these pieces here and here in the new student center space, that's all um, reclaimed wood from the gym bleachers. Those bleachers were removed a couple of years ago, labor that our interns performed um, in order to get those removed, stacked and preserved for later reuse. Um, but these bleachers have been on campus since JCCC opened its campus doors in 1972. And so it was really special to us to be able to reclaim and reuse these in such gorgeous applications um, as you'll be able to see um, as we return to campus. And I'm happy to provide additional photos if you'd like to see some additional use of those because it is just lovely. Um, so you may be wondering after all of this, what's next for Zero Waste at JCCC? Um, we have a new materials management plan in the works to get us to zero waste to landfill by 2025. And we really think that that's uh, an attainable goal. We encourage four R's, both for campus consideration and for folks who do this work at home. First of all, we encourage people to rethink. Is there a way to not buy or to not take one of these items? Ask and question yourself if you can handle the need for a new item in a more sustainable way. We encourage people to reduce their waste by working with companies that have take back recycling programs and, and to also use your power as a consumer to pressure vendors to reduce packaging or to provide more environmentally responsible options. On campus, we work to reuse um, surplus items more effectively and we are implementing improved methods for construction and demolition recycling along with a bagless recycling system. Um, that new materials management plan should roll out sometime here soon. Um, and as I said, we still have that goal of 2025 for our zero waste campus initiative. So that's the extent of the new information that I have for you today. I ask you to remember that you have a considerable amount of power in changing the way that we buy materials to seek out recycled content and to be mindful of the way that you dispose of them. So don't, don't wish cycle, right? Um, don't forget that we have paid internships, campus leadership, and volunteer opportunities on campus. Paid internships are posted on the careers page. Um, campus leadership information is available by looking for the Student Sustainability Committee on our website. And those volunteer opportunities are probably easiest to find by dropping a line to recycle at jccc.edu. Um, so remember, that's check out the website for internships on careers um, at .jccc.edu. Campus leadership is the Student Sustainability Committee, and the volunteer opportunities are via the recycle at jccc.edu email. Um, with all of that, I look forward to seeing your questions. I look forward to interacting with you in the, your discussion boards. And gosh, I can't wait till we're back on campus and we have the chance to see each other again. Take care.